Hello, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, I'm Derek Walker and uh, we are today completing our study in the book of Nahum, Nahum chapter 3. And uh, the title tonight is Vengeance Vindicated. We will uh, look at uh, some questions at the end if you want to send uh, an email to the Oxford Bible Church at gmail.com. Um, I'll uh, look at any questions at the end. Let's just start with a word of prayer, shall we? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you reveal your truth and your character and your nature, that we might know you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we've uh, we've seen in the book of Nahum, it's got three chapters, <coughs> very poetic. The first chapter is really a d description of God as the avenger, as the judge. And so the title today is Vengeance Vindicated. Vengeance, um, we might say, oh, that sounds like a bad thing. Well, that's because God says to us, we are not to take vengeance. Uh, personally um, but vengeance is a judicial act vengeance is um, as it were punishment and punishment for sin and so God says vengeance is mine says the Lord it's not that vengeance is wrong in itself but only God really is qualified uh, to to take vengeance but also God has delegated authority to the to you know the the powers of of of, the, of a government also to to exercise uh, judgment but it's not for us to personally move in vengeance but rather we should submit the matter to the authorities that's what uh, Romans 13 says so uh, so Nahum is about vengeance it's about divine vengeance and uh, in chapter one we saw the divine warrior God moving in judgment he is angry against Nineveh he's angry against the Assyrian Empire they have been so cruel for so long that their time is now up and God is going to end them and that's what Nahum chapter 1 is really an announcement that uh, uh, it's God is now going to uh, exercise that judgment and it will be a final judgment on the Assyrian Empire and then in, uh, in, in chapter 2 is a description of that judgment being carried out it's particularly how the Babylonians and the um, uh, and the Medes uh, are going to overrun the great capital city Nineveh the greatest city on earth at that time and uh, it's it describes it in vivid detail because Nahum actually sees it in a vision and to realize how impressive this is that when Nahum gave this prophecy actually uh, at the height of the power of Assyria it was the biggest empire ever until that point it's it, its military machine was was efficient and terrifying and so the thought that uh, the capital city could be totally destroyed uh, in this way it seems seems impossible but when Nahum said it it only happened a few decades later that Nineveh fell exactly as was described in the prophecy in chapter 2 and um, we saw that last time 612 BC is when it happened and uh, it describes how this seemingly invincible city with its invincible walls uh, because of the storm that, that God brought and the, the, um, there was a flood that totally uh, broke through part of the wall and then the attackers could gain entrance and, uh, and it was all uh, over ver over very quickly and uh, Nineveh fell dramatically just after a short siege of three months whereas normally the sieges could have gone on for years and, and they wouldn't have captured it but God God called time on Nineveh and now in chapter 3 we are uh, this is vengeance vindicated in other words a big theme in chapter 3 is 
the, you know, God is just, but and he and it's important that we know that when God moves in judgment, He is being just, and so this is like a vindication that this judgment had to happen, that God was right to do this. And uh, we'll see in this that, in fact, everyone else agrees entirely because they have suffered so much at the cruelty of Assyria over many years that everyone actually applauds this judgment of God when Assyria falls. It's not like people are saying, oh, that's not fair. Why did this happen? Because everyone realized Assyria deserved it. And so in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, we see this opening phrase, woe to the bloody city. Now, this word woe is, is like a judgment w word. You see it in the book of Revelation as well. It's, it's, it's often was con connected with death. So if you were at a funeral of somebody, people would be saying woe, woe. Alas, it's like our alas, you know, and normally it would be, oh, what a shame this person has died. But then, so the word got connected with death, but then it then was applied to judgment. In other words, the prophets were saying, woe to this city because it's, it's doomed. It's doomed to die. Uh, and therefore this is an announcement of the judgment and the reason for the judgment one of the reasons is given immediately it says woe to the bloody city woe to the bloody city in other words this Assyrian empire had been particularly cruel over the top in its cruelty we've talked about that earlier and it had caused much massacre and much death and uh it was horrendous in its cruelty, and they were proud of their cruelty as well. They used it to terrorize their enemies. And so because of that cruelty, so God hates the taking of innocent life, you know. Um, there, yes, there's going to be casualties in war, but when, um, you know, it, it's like over the top and innocent life is, 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 is just killed willy-nilly, as it were, then God hates the taking of innocent life. You know, even in abortion, he takes that very seriously. That is the shedding of innocent blood uh, on a great scale. And that's what the Assyrian Empire was guilty of. And therefore, what we're going to see in this chapter is, again, the principle of sowing and reaping. What you do to others is, is going to be done to you. And we're going to see that God measures the judgment on Assyria according to how they've treated others. They are going to have a very bloody end. They are going to, 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 do, to face that. And uh, it, it talks about another aspect of their sins. It is all full of lies and robbery. Full of lies and robbery. So the driving thing that um, drove this nation was this lust for power, lust for control, lust to gobble up all the other countries. Um, and in order, then, and that's the robbery. They would, as it were, pillage and plunder all the nations around it and for, for itself, and it, it would never have enough. And in order to do that, it would also operate in lies and deception. Um, and then it says its victim never departs, or what it means is its prey never departs, literally, its prey never departs. At the end of chapter 2, if you remember it, it describes, chapter 2 verse 12, uh, 11 and 12, describes the Assyrians as a pack of lions. They like to see themselves as lions, you know, because the lions are the, the king of the animals. And so he's... So in chapter 11, it's saying, chapter 2, verse 11, where is the dwelling of the lions? In other words, they've lost their dwelling place, Nineveh destroyed. And it descri describes their appetite in verse 12. The lion tore in pieces, enough for his cubs, killed for his lionesses, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. So this is the Assyrian Empire having... And, and here, going now to chapter 3, verse 1, it says, its prey never never departs or never ceases. In other words, this it, it, it's a constant eating up of other nations, attacking other nations, destroying other nations, taking them plunder. And it, it's, its prey never 
never departs. In other words, this seizing of prey never finishes. And so God says it, it's enough. Now, before we go into it in more detail, I just want to mention a, another interesting angle on this, uh, that in my studies elsewhere, it's interesting that the these Assyrian kings, particularly um, the last set of Assyrian kings, leading up to the final one. And I'm thinking of names such as Tiglath-Pileser, uh, Sennacherib in particular, his son Ezahadan, and his son Ashurbanipal. These were the big kings. And um, Nahum prophesied in the days of Ashurbanipal. And in many ways, these are in the Bible a type of the Antichrist. A type of the Antichrist. Um, and... For instance, uh, I'll show you that in a minute in Micah chapter 5. And it's interesting that they, they operated like the Antichrist. The Antichrist is, is like this. He goes over, he, he kind of comes out to conquer the world. You know, when the tribulation starts, he is the one who goes out to conquer the world. But he uses deception. And he will pretend to be your friend. He will make a kind of agreement with you. And, and you think that, oh, you, you're going to do well out of this agreement. And then once he's got you where he wants you, he, he then dominates you. And once your defenses are down. And so and that's how the Antichrist is going to use deception uh, in part of his his charm and deception to take over the world and that that is something that we see in the bible that these assyrian um kings operated in and uh we let's just have a look at micah chapter 5 micah chapter 5 because this is a prophecy it would seem of the anti of christ and the antichrist and um, it's just an interesting one. In, in Micah 5, verse 2, you'll know this verse very well. It says, You, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will come forth to me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So this is talking about the birth of the king, the ruler in Israel, the one who will rule over the whole earth, actually. But he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And then it says, therefore, he will give them up. But what it means is, because Israel rejected the Messiah, he will actually give them up. He will uh, give them up to discipline um, and for almost 2,000 years, but not forever. God hasn't finished with Israel because it says he will give them up until, until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. And so it's saying that the Messiah will be absent from Israel, but until the time of the tribulation, because the tribulation is the time of labor pains. And that which is to be given birth is the kingdom of God on the earth. And so Jesus, when he returns the second time, he will establish his kingdom on the earth. But until, uh, and that will happen after this time of labor pains. And so he says he will give them up until the time of the tribulation and until the, the time for the kingdom to be given birth. That is the time when the Messiah will return to reign as the king. Then it says the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. When Jesus returns, he will complete the regathering of Israel from all the nations back to the land of Israel. Jesus described it as blowing the trumpet and and all the elect from the four corners of the earth will be will be gathered back to Israel. And then it says then it describes Jesus's reign during the thousand years and he will stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God and they will abide for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. That's verse 4, saying that Jesus will then reign from Israel over the whole world. And this one, verse 5, is the interesting one now. Verse 5, this one shall be peace. He's our peace. And he will bring peace on the earth for a thousand years. But notice this. Now he talks about the Antichrist. And he describes the Antichrist as the Assyrian. 
which is interesting. So in other words, he's saying the Antichrist is one of the types of the Antichrist is the Assyrian, the Assyrian kings. And um, it says, when the Assyrian comes into our land, so this is a picture actually of Armageddon, the Assyrian, the Antichrist, comes into Israel when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. And they will waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at his entrances. Thus he, Christ, shall deliver us from the Assyrian. So this is uh, when he comes into our land, when he treads within our borders. So this uh, prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet. It's a future fulfillment that talks about Jesus when he returns, will deliver Israel from the Assyrian. So here is a hint that the Assyrian kings, in first of all in their violence and in their deception, are a picture of the Antichrist. Now, f to complete this picture, for instance, if you go to this, this is what happened in the time of Hezekiah with Sennacherib. We see the way that the Sennacherib blasphemed God, spoke evil of God, and that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to challenge God, he's going to speak evil of God, and in, in um, Isaiah chapter 36, let's quickly start there, um, and, and I think we saw earlier, I think, that it talked about how the Assyrian king had particularly devised a plot against the Lord. Um, that's one reason for his judgment. Um, in, in Isaiah 36.10, this is when Sennacherib had invaded Judah and uh, was actually on the point of destroying Judah. Um, but praise God, Hezekiah was turning to the, to the Lord at this time, asking God to save them. from. They were about to wipe out Israel. And this is a picture of Armageddon, if you like, the Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, like the Antichrist, at the point of actually, he's wiped out most of the cities, and only Jerusalem is actually left at this point. And, and his messenger says this, um, verse 10, have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So this is a terrible lie saying, your God is with me. Your God told me to come and destroy you. <laughs> what a lie that was. And, and then in chapter 37, we see the kind of deception uh, uh, as well that they use and particularly blaspheming God. In fact, in verse 6, the, uh, the servants of the king of Hezekiah come to Isaiah, and this is Isaiah 37, verse 6. And Isaiah says to them, Say to your master, Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. So they, so they were blaspheming the Lord. And notice the kind of words they were using in challenging God, basically saying, your God is not powerful, your God's not powerful enough, we're stronger than God. This is part of the sin of Assyria was pride. They thought they were the God-appointed rightful rulers of the earth, and um, they were stronger than any, any God, like uh, even Jehovah. And in their pride, pride comes before a fall. And so um, notice... He says, um, let's go to verse 10. Thus you will speak, this is Isaiah 37, 10. Thus you will speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, <laughs> saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. In other words, do you see this? This is the kind of way the Antichrist will, will speak about God and say, God, don't trust in him. He's, he's weak, I'm stronger than he is. Um, boastful, proud, proud arrogance against God. He says, look, verse 11, look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by utterly destroying them, and shall you be delivered? In other words, we're stronger than your God. Have the gods of the other nations delivered them from us? 
no, verse 12, and, and so on. And then Hezekiah, in response, he basically says, God, listen to the evil words that they have blasphemed you. Um, what are you going to do about it, God? Come to our rescue and save us. And then Isaiah, the prophet, makes a prophecy at the end of um, chapter uh, 37 and basically says, because you've prayed, Hezekiah, God is going to destroy those Assyrians. And in the same way at the Battle of Armageddon, the Assyrian will invade the land with all his armies and, uh, and, uh, and even though he seems to be so mighty uh, and he'll be blaspheming against God, the Israel at that point will believe and they will call on the Lord to save them. And he will come and he will save them. Jesus will come and save them and see what happens. How does God do it? Let's go to right at the end in verse 36. Um, Isaiah prophesies that God is going to save the city and he personally is going to defend the city. That's verse 35. Let's go. Isaiah 37, 35. God says, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And then it says, verse 36, then the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus, by the way, the angel of the Lord is Jesus, himself went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. And so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away and returned home and remained in Nineveh. And that's, he was actually assassinated by, by his sons. And so, and um, notice, this is a picture of, of Christ coming out of heaven, the angel of the Lord, destroying all the armies of the Antichrist and saving his people. So when we look at the sin of Assyria, this is actually a type of, of the sin of the Antichrist, in his violence, in his deception, in his robbery, and, and bringing all the finances of the world under his power, by his lies and by his, uh, uh, you know, and being ruthless. And so this is why his judgment is, 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 is righteous, vengeance vindicated. All right, now, we're going back now to um, Nahum chapter 3. And um, we have next, a um, bit like we had in chapter 2, a kind of graphic action sequence. It's as, if, it's as if he's in the middle of the battle, and Nahum is experiencing it. So I'm just going to read verse three and, verse 2 and verse 3 very quickly, to, so you get the feeling of the action. All right? He, it's as if Nahum's standing in the middle of it in an open vision. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Verse 3. Horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There's a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. And so this is describing when the, the attack happens on Nineveh, there'll be the breakthrough of the walls, and then all these chariots and horsemen will, will invade into Nineveh, and there'll be a multitude of dead bodies. And the, why this is appropriate is this is exactly how the Assyrians would, would destroy and kill multitudes of, of their enemies. They would attack enemy fortresses and, and would not... Worry about killing, killing them all, and uh, so and they actually made boasts about how they piled bodies up high. They would make piles of of skulls as well, and um, that this is how they treated their enemies. And therefore, God is saying, "Okay, this is how it's going to happen to you too." It what goes around comes around <laughs> uh, always bear that in mind <laughs> in how you treat other people um, and so they are now going to experience a mass slaughter because they have done that to others and then verse 4 is is a rather difficult verse but this again explains why God is angry with them 
um, and why this vengeance is vindicated. And now, first of all, there was a kind of masculine image that we saw the bloody city, you know, this cruel side of evil. You know, there are two sides of evil. One is the dragon, which is the intimidation, the, the cruel uh, type of evil. Uh, but the other is the serpent, which is the subtle, deceptive form of evil. And so one is a kind of masculine form of evil. But here in verse 4, if you like, is the feminine or the seductive form of evil. If you, if you understand, he, now the city is compared to a harlot. So this is an, so on the one side it was this vicious, cruel, bloodthirsty, nasty military machine. Uh, but also the other side of her evil was that she was like a harlot, like a prostitute. And this is where we need to have a biblical understanding of what's being said here. Because this operates on two levels. One is on the sexual level. Obviously, we understand the prostitution and and pornography, in a sense, is a, is a form of that. Um, and it is, we might say, that is the use of something that is God given, but the use in an immoral way. And so, uh, uh, but there's something deeper going on too. Um, but what the harlot will do. Is, is pretend to be offering, if you like, a positive, exciting experience. But actually, she's doing it. What she does will destroy the other person, destroy that person's integrity, destroy that person's morality, destroy that person's self-respect, destroy that person's ability to have a, a proper relationship. She um, pretends to be offering everything but actually she's come coming really to empty their pockets and to to take from them and to destroy them in the process and this is uh, you know it's like these adverts for gambling you know they print pretend oh we're going to give you an exciting experience you know you're going to have great fun you're going to have the thrill you know and it's as if they they want you to have a wonderful time but the truth is they're just out to suck as much money out of you as possible and so that in the bible this is used for uh the sexual harlotry or immorality is a picture of going after false gods, going after false idols, and getting into the occult. Okay, um, and we'll, he'll talk about sorcery in a bit. In other words, the parallel is this: in the sexual relationship. That belongs to between the husband and the wife. So uh, for a woman and, and, and a man. But if they go into, if one of them goes into a sexual relationship outside that marriage, uh, and particularly they, they become an adulterer, a fornicator, even a harlot. And they, they are abusing that thing that God has given in order to get a personal gain for themselves. And they are doing operating immorally. They are not abiding by God's laws and God's guidelines and God's boundaries. They're breaking through those boundaries out of their lust for either money or that experience. And that's a picture... When people go after idols or false gods, and that instead of giving their heart to God and worshipping God, they break through that boundary. And this is also true for people involving in the occult. It's the same thing. They are trying to get hold of spiritual power outside of God. They are breaking through the boundaries that God has set, and they are giving their heart to demons, 
They're giving their heart to idols, to false gods. And when they do that, they're committing, as it were, spiritual immorality. And, and so you, to understand this, you have to understand it on both levels. What, what he's actually talking about, and you'll see this in the book of Revelation, that on the beast, you've got those two forms of evil. You've got the beast, but you've got a harlot sitting on the beast. This is Revelation 17. The beast is the political power that can be very cruel and, and gobble, gobble you up, as it were. But the harlot is the religion is the false religion that is promoted by that state. And the harlot is, is another form of evil. It's, it's more seductive. It, it's, it looks beautiful. Uh, and yet it's very dangerous. Because it, it is actually, although it's made to look like appealing and exciting, it's actually designed to, to, to destroy you. And so this is, I believe, talking about, verse 4, because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries. So what this is saying, and this is true about other world powers, this harlot is seductive. This harlot is deceptive. She is pretending. She's saying, oh, look, I'm beautiful. You engage in me. I'll, I'll give you something positive. And it, she's the mistress of sorceries. Let me just mention that. The, in other words, Assyria was the center of occultism in the world. And in fact, Ashurbanipal, he actually created a library in Nineveh. And it says, well, that's a very great thing. He's got a, a library. Surely that's good. But the vast majority of the books in his library in Nineveh that they discovered were all occultic books how to you know different ways of doing spells how to make prognostications how to you know um you know make uh predictions and so on and so the their the religion of assyria was was not just full of false gods but it was also full of sorcery sorcery is the use of occultic power to control other people, witchcraft, to, to cast spells, to do curses. This kind of use of occultic power is forbidden by God, you see. And this is, um, she, she, so as the empire spread, she seduced all the different nations into following her religion, which was, which was occultic. And it says she sells nations through her harlotries. She actually, she actually brings those nations into bondage through them and families through their sorceries. In a sense, she enslaves them. She brings them into spiritual bondage. And that's what, another reason why God is angry. This harlot brings nations into spiritual bondage. We, we actually see that with Israel. I don't have time to, to cover this, but in 2 Kings 16, there's a story of Ahaz, and Ahaz asks for the Assyrian king's help. 2 Kings 16, 6. Uh, and he basically, well, let's quickly go there. And this is the kind of uh, deception that, that took place. 2 Kings 16, 6. It says that Rezin, king of Syria, um, basically, verse 6 says that um, Judah was under great pressure because Rezin, the king of Syria, actually joined forces with the king of Israel against Judah. So Judah is, was in great danger. You can read about this in Isaiah 7 as well. And basically... Isaiah in Isaiah 7 says turn to God Ahaz Ahaz was the king of Judah turn to God Ahaz but the trouble is he was a wicked king uh, and instead of turning to God he turned to the king of Assyria for help and that's what the Israel is going to do in the tribulation you see they're going to trust in the Antichrist they're going to make a covenant with the Antichrist that actually brings them under the power of the Antichrist which is one big reason why they're going to suffer so much in the tribulation but notice verse 7 Ahaz sent messages 
to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I'm your servant and your son, come and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. And then the next verses say that actually he, um, he, he, he gives them some money. So from Ahaz's point of view, it's, let's, it's a financial transaction. I'm going to give you a bunch of money. I'm asking you to, to attack Syria and weaken Syria to, to save me. So it was a straightforward transaction. As you read on, though, you find, and tiglath Pileser agrees with it. Everything seems like a good deal, but Isaiah had warned him against this. But the reason is, you don't make a deal with the devil. Because what happened then is Ahaz came, uh, the Assyrian didn't just stay with that agreement. He used that now as a, as a basis to dominate judah now judah came under the domination of assyria from that point and assyria then started imposing their own worship rules and if you read on you'll see that ahaz made changes in the temple he brought in an assyrian altar it was like to keep the king of assyria happy he had to compromise the the, the worship at the temple he even stopped the worship at the temple and the same thing happened later under Ezzahadan. He enforced Assyrian worship on Israel, and Manasseh, the most evil king, basically brought in all kinds of idols. And so by submitting to Assyria, they had to submit to Assyria's religion. And that is the harlot aspect. To, when you are unfaithful to God, you know, by worship, by going after the occult, or after a false religion, or worshipping an idol, putting it above God, you're, you're being that immoral one. And the harlot is a picture of that religion, or that occultic force that tries to lure you, spiritually lure you, into worshipping something other than God. That's the spirit of the harlot. And the harlot religion often works through a particular state. Assyria had a harlot religion. And and you might think, well, we don't have that. But in a sense, we do. Increasingly nowadays, we have a secular humanistic state, religion, trying to force itself on us, that, that denies God, that denies the word of God, that denies sexuality, that denies there's a difference between a man and a woman, that, that God created man and woman, that tries to wipe out gender and tries to force that agenda upon us. And that this is all coming from the basis that there is no God. It's really an atheistic basis. And if you don't comply with that form of religion, then you're, you're punished. And the, the harlot is the spiritual force that comes upon you to comply and to submit to the state religion, the state viewpoint, in order just to kind of survive in the society. And so, for instance, people in atheistic states come under terrible oppression. And if they try and practice their faith, or they're caught practicing their faith, they come under tr tremendous persecution. That's the harlot at work. Putting pressure on, by seduction or by force, in to cause you to actually uh, follow their religion. In a serious case... It was a false religion of false gods and and sorceries. So I've done my best to try and unpack why God is so angry against it. It wasn't just that they were brutal in killing people. It's because they spread this false harlot religion that involved occultism. And God hates occultism. So in the same way that wrong sexuality crosses barriers that God has established... You know, whether you're talking about homosexuality or, or other such things, crossing those barriers that God has established. So God has established a barrier between the natural world and the spiritual world. And when you cross that barrier, which in, in terms of occultism, against God's boundaries, against God's rules, then you are involved in, in serious sin. And, and that is a very dangerous thing for you to do. And so, because this harlot, 
because she acted as a harlot, that's a big reason why judgment's coming. So ver- let's just read verse 4 one, once more, and then we'll, we'll move, move full speed ahead through this passage. Because of the multitude of the harlotries, of this seductive harlot, and this was especially for the people of Israel, they were getting drawn in, because they were under the Assyrian domination, they were getting drawn into the Assyrian religion and the Assyrian ways of thinking, and the Assyrian kind of occultism that was going in. And they were being seduced into that. And she was the mistress of sorceries. In other words, she was the center of occultism in the world. That's a big reason why God judged them. One big reason why Tibet got judged by coming under Chinese domination is because Tibet was the center of occultism in the world. And it says, she sells nations through her harlotries. She brings nations into slavery and bondage, and families through her sorceries. All right, verse 5. Because of these things, God says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this is God in military mode. All right, the Lord of hosts means the Lord of armies. And if God says he's against you, boy, you're in trouble. All right. In other words, I am coming as the divine warrior and I'm going to come and I'm going to finish you. I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this is very interesting. The way he describes what happens next. I will lift your skirts. Notice he's still thinking of her as a harlot. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Now, in the Babylonian world at that time, one one of the major ways you would punish a harlot or an immoral woman is by actually stripping her naked so that she would have to go through the streets naked. Everyone would see her naked. And again, it's kind of like the punishment fits the crime. Okay, She's been going around exposing herself, if you like, in an immoral way. So her punishment would be that she would be exposed. She would be stripped naked. That her skirt, as it were, would be lifted. In other words, God's saying, I'm going to strip you naked, humiliate you, and show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Now, this is very, this is very deep. Um, again, you, we might say the Assyrians had done that to others. They had stripped these countries and stripped them naked, as it were, made them defenseless. And God's saying, I'm going to do the same to you. We can apply this generally to those who are in pride. He, Assyria's been saying, I'm proud. It's almost like this harlot had been displaying herself. And Assyria had been displaying itself as the great one, the proud one, the, the powerful one. And God is gonna, says to the proud, okay, I'm going to bring you down. You see, if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. And God is saying, I'm going to bring you down, Assyria. You've been boasting in your greatness. I'm going to show the world just how great you really are. You know, Um, you know, if God really uses you in a big way and you start going around in your heart, at least, or even outwardly saying, look how great I am. Look how amazing I am. God may will probably if you stick to that too much, God will say, okay, I'm going to show you what you're really like. And God takes away his grace from you. He takes away his covering from you. And then you find out what you can really do on your own. And that's pretty pathetic. In other words, unbelievers, particularly unbelievers, who think they're so great and so strong and so invulnerable and so gifted... They only have that because they have a certain grace of God that God gives all people. And one day God's going to say, I'm going to take away your covering. I'm going to take away my hand of blessing from you. And then we'll see what you're really like. And when you see, once that is that person is fully exposed as they are on their own without any grace from God, they will be seen as horrendous, as pathetic, and as utterly self-centered, and they will be humiliated. And that's what's going to happen, really, in hell, that people are stripped naked 
of any blessing or grace of God, and all they will have is themselves, and then that will be humiliating. And so God is saying to Assyria, it's time now, I'm going to strip you naked. I'm going to strip you of all your defenses. Everyone thinks you're this great mighty thing, but I'm going to pull the plug on you, and we're going to see what you're really like without my covering and my my blessing upon you. You know, any this could happen to any nation. If they get proud before God, God will say, okay, you don't want me, you think you're the great thing, you've rejected me, I'm going to pull the plug on you, and we'll see what you're really like when you're not covered. So basically, he says, I'm going to treat you like a harlot, I'm going to strip you naked, I'm going to humiliate you, and every all the nations will see when you're totally destroyed they'll see how weak you are how pathetic you are you'll be reduced to nothing and um that's what god is saying and we're going to see this principle out, worked out in the remaining verses god almost is triumphs over them and and says i'm going to strip you bare and even worse actually verse 6 I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a a spectacle. Now, some of the Jewish rabbis thought that this this is either dirt that would be... Not only is she going around naked, dirt, or possibly excrement, is thrown upon her, making her vile, making her a spectacle. All right? Total humiliation. And, And, of course, Nineveh was destroyed and totally buried, covered in dirt. But again, the poetic, um, the poetic, uh, uh, you know, it, it's appropriate because he's talking about she spread occultism in the earth. She spread an, um, idolatry in the earth. And this word filth, abominable filth, is usually connected with idolatry. You see, when you worship an idol, when you worship a false god, when you get involved in the occult, The Bible says it makes you dirty. It makes you spiritually dirty and spiritually filthy and spiritually smelly. Yeah, disgusting. And because this harlot has has spread her filth around the world, and that people used to say, you know, pornography is 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 filth. You see, and because that's been they she spread that around the world, so. That same filth, uh, she is going to be now covered in filth. You see how appropriate it is. What you put out is going to come back on you. I will cast the filth upon you, make you vile, make you a spectacle. Total humiliation. In other words, God's going to completely destroy Assyria and bring her to nothing. But the reason that he does it is because of her evil sorcery and her harlotry all right verse 7 it will come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and that really means shrink from you you know when you look at something disgusting you just shrink in other words Nineveh will look so so destroyed and so reduced to nothing that they they will shrink from you in horror and they will say, Nineveh is laid waste. He's saying, Nineveh will be totally destroyed. Of course, this, is, this prophecy came to pass. And then it says, who will bemoan her? Where will I seek comforters for you? And now God makes the point, I want, who is it that will actually mourn her? You know, who, at her funeral, who is actually going to cry? And who's going to mourn and feel sorry for this person who died? Um, and... The answer is nobody, nobody, because everyone knows that she deserved it. And therefore, everyone will agree that vengeance is vindicated, that God's judgment on Nineveh is justified. Nobody, everyone suffered at her hands. They've been deceived, they've been plundered, they've been destroyed. And so nobody's unhappy that she is destroyed. They agree that God's judgment is true. Then verse 8 take, is, a, is, a, is a new paragraph that um, is interesting. It says, are you better than no Ammon? And actually this 
No Amon is a city in Egypt. It means literally, No Amon means the city of Amon, which is one of the Egyptian gods. And it's actually Thebes. This is the name of Thebes, which is where there is, is Karnak is now. And it's very, and Luxor, and, and tremendous remains are still there of Thebes. This was a major um, Egyptian city, 400 miles south of Cairo. And that was situated by the river. That's the River Nile. And, the, and what he's saying is, what he's saying in this passage is, are you better than no? Are you better than Thebes? In other words, Thebes was an evil city, and, and actually Thebes had just been destroyed um, uh, by the Assyrians. And he's saying, are you better than Thebes? In other words, if Thebes was destroyed, you're no better. In fact, you're worse than Thebes, and therefore you're going to be destroyed too. Are you better than Noamon that was situated by the river Nile, that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, and whose wall was the sea? And he's actually saying, see, when this prophecy was given, uh, nobody would think that Assyria could ever fall. Nineveh, the capital city, was surrounded by lots of powerful cities in this big, powerful empire. Who could possibly destroy Nineveh? And God is saying, well, actually, look at something that's just recently happened. This, the destruction of Thebes, happened in 663 BC, and Nahum's prophecy was just a few years after that. This, this was the big event that had just happened in the world. The Thebes, this mighty city of Egypt that no one thought would ever could be destroyed, has absolutely been destroyed. And he's saying, just as Thebes is destroyed, the same thing's going to happen to you. They deserved it, and you deserve it even more. And notice it says how well defended Thebes was. Just like Nineveh, they, Nineveh had the Tigris and various other rivers surrounding it, and they, those um, rivers were like walls that protected it. Um, they had the rivers and the moats, and, and likewise Thebes had different rivers, the Nile River and other rivers and other canals and so on, so that she was surrounded by a wall of water that protected her, so she felt very safe and secure. And then it goes on, not only that, in verse 9, she had lots of strong allies that would come to her defense. Ethiopia, it says in verse 9, which is Sudan, and Egypt, which was the where the Nile Basin was, uh, and that, uh, and it was boundless. In other words, she had unlimited strength from her neighbouring um, allies. Put and Lubim, that's probably Libya, were your helpers. In other words, Thebes also seemed to be impregnable. As, you know, Nineveh seemed impregnable at this time, but the prophet's saying, well, th look at Thebes. They were impregnable. They had all kinds of allies supporting it. And yet, it was destroyed, utterly destroyed. And there it is in verse 10. Yet, and the idea is, the same thing's going to happen to you, Nineveh. You think you're impregnable, but God is going to strip you. Like a harlot is stripped naked, God's going to strip you bare and humiliate you so that everyone who looks on you will, will, will despise you. Notice verse 10, yet Thebes was carried away. She went into captivity. In other words, you're going to go into captivity too. And actually, it was Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian, who actually did this in 663. The Assyrians themselves did this. And here we see the cruelty of the Assyrians that we're talking about as we read on. Her young children were also dashed to pieces at the head of every street. In other words, they didn't even spare the children. They dashed them to pieces at the corner of the streets where everyone could see it. Just a terrible act of cruelty. Just wiped out the next generation. Just to terrorize them. And they cast lots for her honorable men. In other words, the, the honorable men, the nobles, were sent into slavery. And all her great men were bound in chains. So they were sent off captive. And in, in particular, the noble men. The leaders were sent into slavery, and it's saying the same thing's going to happen to you, Nineveh. 
And notice the, this theme of being stripped naked. God is going to strip the proud naked and humble them. Verse 11. You also will be drunk. And uh, this is a picture in the prophets. That talk about God. Will, when God judges people. He makes them drink from the cup of his wrath until they're drunk. And then they can't think straight and they can't respond properly and and it says and actually literally the 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 historical accounts tell us that the Ninevites were drunk when they were at, attacked by the armies but also mentally they're drunk they're unable to think right unable to take the right actions and that's part of the judgment that came on them and he says you will be hidden in other words you're going to go into hiding and you will also seek refuge from the enemy in other words, he says, you've always been the aggressor, but now that's going to turn around. And just like you sent others into hiding, you're going to be the one now trying to hide from the enemy. You're going to know what it's like to come under attack. You are now going to be the defenseless one. Verse 12. He, this is again Nineveh being stripped naked because it was protected by all kinds of cities and fortresses throughout the Assyrian Empire. So any invader had to first of all overcome these fortresses. But what he says in verse 12 is, I'm going to strip you of your defenses. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they're shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. And this is when the first ripe figs come, what they would do is shake the tree and all these figs would just come straight off and they could, you can just eat, eat them. And what he's saying is your mighty fortresses, they're going to fall like figs. Just a little bit of shaking and they're going to collapse. And that's actually what happened when the Babylonians and the Medes invaded. All the major fortresses just collapsed before them until only Nineveh was left. Verse, nine, verse 13. Surely your people in your midst are women. Um, now, in other words, that saying that that these mighty warriors that were the Assyrians, the soldiers that were meant to be the defense of the city, will actually fight like women. <laughs> okay. Now that's not saying men are superior to women, but you know it's two things I would say here. First of all, that you know God has actually made men different from women. We mustn't pretend that there's a there's no difference. God has given men an, a greater measure of strength and God has given women a greater measure of beauty. And so men are better at some things, women are better at other things. And in particular, of course, warfare, and especially in those days, um, it was men who went to war, not, not the women. And so the women weren't trained for warfare. So what this is saying is that your soldiers are going to fight like untrained women. And they they are not... You think this is the greatest army in the world, but when God strips you of your anointing, of your grace, then you 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 become useless. Uh, and so it, then it says, the gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. God's going to take his hedge of protection off you, and, and now the enemies are going to just come right in, right in through the gates. The gates of the land are wide open, and fires will devour the bars of your gates. In other words, even if you slam the doors of your gates closed and put a big bar across them, yet the enemy will be able to set those gates on fire. In other words, all your defenses will come to nothing. All the things you're trusting in, that you thought you were so strong, once God takes his hand off you, you'll see how pathetic you really are. You'll be stripped naked and the enemy will overrun you. And that's what happened in 612 BC. It was only a two-month siege. And Nineveh fell. Because God, even they thought they were impregnable. But without God, once God calls time on you, there's no, there's no you're, you are defenseless. And once we know that, then we should flee to God for our safety. Rather than be proud and trust in ourselves, you see. Verse 14. Now he kind of mocks them and says, look, you're, you're, you're going to come under a siege. Okay, there's, and this is what happened. They were sieged by the Babylonians. 
He says, draw your water for the siege. First thing you need is lots of water if you're going to be in the siege so that you're, you can survive the siege. Draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. In other words, make all your fortifications stronger. Go to the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. In other words, take get the clay and, and tread the mortar. Make lots of bricks because you need to make the walls thicker. You need to repair the walls. You need to get ready for this invading army. But then the next verse says it will all be useless. All your little puny efforts will come to nothing because he says there the fire will devour you. And, and we've said before that there's much evidence that fire destroyed Nineveh. And he says, the fire will des will destroy you and the sword will cut you off. The enemy soldiers will come through with the sword and you'll be killed. It, all your best efforts will come to nothing because God has called time on you. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And it says, it will eat you up like a locust. In other words, the, the invading armies will be like locusts. A swarm of millions of locusts will just that gobble up everything in their path, they're going to come through and they're totally going to devastate you. Because God says, I'm taking your defenses down. I'm stripping you naked. And then he kind of, again, um, mocks them. And now he he says that they are like locusts. All right, He switches the locust. He's still using the picture of the locust. And he says, they are like locusts. He says, make yourself many like the locust. Okay, Even though, multiply yourself. Make yourself many like a swarm of locusts. It will be no good. Once God is not is no longer with you, there is no protection that will protect you. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts, he says. Uh, verse 16. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. So one thing, they multiplied themselves like locusts. There were all kinds of merchants operating in the Assyrian Empire, uh, trading and everything going on. And the merchants were, take, were enjoying a good system there. Uh, more than the stars of heaven, the locust plunders and far, f flies away. What he's saying is these merchants are not going to come to your help. They are just going to, they're just there to get what they can, and then they're going to fly away. In other words, this Assyrian empire was built on greed. See, when an empire is built on greed and lust and power, they, when you're, con the more you're controlled by lust, the more you lose your moral center. You lose your moral, um, yeah, you lose your moral center. And so these people, they're just in it for themselves. So when the attack comes, these merchants are just interesting and are just plundering what they want for themselves and then go away. They, they have no loyalty to the empire. They have no need to defend the empire. In fact, many of them have been imported from other countries. They have no loyalty to the Assyrian Empire because it's every man for themselves. That's the morality of this empire. And so, although it looked strong on the outside, on the inside it was weak. It was degenerate because nobody, everyone was in it for themselves. And so they, they, they fly away. First sign of trouble, they flee away. Verse 17 continues this picture. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. And it's basically, he says, your commanders and your generals, your, uh, they actually are, are cowards. They, when it comes to it, when they, yeah, they were good at brutalizing other countries, but when they actually are now under attack, they, they're not up for the fight. He says they camp in the hedges. They kind of hide in the hedges on the cold day. And then it says when the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. In other words, as soon as the heat gets turned up, they, fl they flee away. What God good as a soldier or a general, as soon as the battle gets a bit hard, they flee away. And that's exactly what happened in the battle for Nineveh. The, 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 the soldiers and the generals just fled for their life. In other words, this apparently apparently strong defense got totally destroyed because they lost their courage. They they lost their moral courage and they lost their courage 
because God stripped that from them. When God leaves you to yourself, you have nothing good in you. You have no courage in you. You have no truth in you. You have no love in you. You, Without God, you are nothing, you see. And so he's describing that these, this great Assyrian war machine actually are, are become a bunch of cowards once God takes his, his presence away from them completely. And so they flee like locusts as soon as the sun comes up they flee and and so it finishes now in verse 18 and 19 with a kind of song of triumph over assyria nobody's sad nobody's sad about their destruction in other words their destruction is everyone agrees is vindicated um, their time is up and they deserve everything that's coming to them Notice verse 18, your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Um, the shepherds are the rulers. And he says the rulers have become complacent. They've become, they slumber. Your nobles rest in the dust. In other words, they're not just sleeping, but now they're dead. All right, this is the destruction of the leadership. And this all happened very quickly uh, and in 612 B.C. Your, and because the shepherds and the leaders are now destroyed, your people are scattered on the, na on the mountains. No one gathers them. All the Assyrians just fled for their lives, scattered in the mountains. And that was the end of Assyria. And verse 19 says, Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. In other words, the, this is a fatal wound. What happened in 612 BC was a fatal wound. Now the Assyrian Empire did continue for about two or three more years. The remnant of Assyria and the king went to Haran, another city, and hold up there, but the, only for another two or three years, and then they were destroyed. But they basically had the fatal wound inflicted on them uh, there in 612 BC when Nineveh was destroyed. And it means... He's going to, the Assyrian Empire is going to die. It's not going to rise again. That's it. God has a, arranged this is the end of the Assyrian Empire. And so it was. Sorry. And notice this. All he, who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. It's interesting, the clapping of hands. We do it in church. But the clapping of hands has a particular meaning, and it's associated with triumph. See, they will clap their hands with you. Now, in a way, when you listen to a great song or a great concert or something, you might clap your hands. It's as if you're saying that that was a triumph. A triumph is what you do after a victory. You triumph over your enemy. You rejoice in your victory. And it says, all who hear news of you will clap your hands over you. Nobody's going to be sorry for you. You deserve it. And what you have reaped, it's only because you have sown it many times. And everyone is going to, when they hear the news of Nineveh's fall, they are just going to clap their hands and rejoice. Why? Because for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? In other words, the whole world has experienced your wickedness, your cruelty, your false sorcery, your idolatry. You have spread evil throughout the world. You have spread wickedness and fear and cruelty throughout the world. And, it, and there is nobody who hasn't been affected. No nation has not been affected by you. And not just occasionally, he says continually. You have continually spread evil in the world. And therefore, nobody's going to feel sorry for you. Everyone's going to rejoice when you fall. Because... In other words, God's vengeance on them was is vindicated, absolutely. Nobody will. It's interesting, the clapping of hands. Let me just point you to the main verse on that. Psalm 47, verse 1. Psalm 47, verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all ye peoples. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You see, clapping is connected with triumph. You know, when you do a clap to the Lord, you're, this is really... You are rejoicing in his victory. He has conquered sin. He has conquered the enemy. He has defeated 
all our enemies. Praise God. He has, and he's risen, and he's ascended on high, far above all principality and power. And, and a, a good response to that is to clap your hands in, the, in triumphing in the victory. It's not trying to get the victory, but you are triumphing in that victory. You are clapping your hands that the enemies of God have been defeated. You rejoice in that. And he, let me just read on a bit. Verse 2, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He's a great king over all the earth. God has won. He has conquered. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. Verse 5, he says, God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. That's Christ ascending on high. He has conquered his enemies and now he has ascended on high to sit at the right hand of God. Now every name that's named is under his feet. And he sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. And when the Lord returns in the second coming and he destroys the Antichrist, the Assyrian, and all the kingdoms of the world are destroyed. You know, heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is triumphing. Heaven is clapping their hands, as it were, because it is righteous judgment. Because these, the, and the Antichrist in particular, will be the essence of evil. And the judgment will be well deserved. And we will rejoice that God actually destroys and judges the wicked. And in doing so, he saves his people from destruction. And so these other nations, and, and including Israel, will rejoice because by Assyria's destruction means their salvation. The Antichrist's destruction will be Israel's salvation. And so it's a very strong book, um, Nahum, um, and it's a book about the judgment of God it's interesting, this is my final thought, that there is only one other book that finishes with a question, and that's the book of Jonah. Just like the book of Nahum, the book of Jonah finishes with a question, and they are both books are about Assyria and Nineveh. And um, at the end of Jonah, it's, it's a different story, because Nineveh has, has repented, and the question at the end of Jonah, which is in Jonah 4.11, um, he basically says, Shall I not pity Nineveh? Shall I not have compassion on Nineveh? They repented. And so God says, Shall I not have compassion? Shall I not relent from my judgment? But here, the question is quite different. God is saying, um, you know, Who will not rejoice in your judgment, Nineveh? In other words, God's patience has run out and God, God's judgment is going to fall on Nineveh and there is no one who will not agree that this is, judgment is vindicated. And so it is, we, 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 God is compassionate to people. He will give people a chance to repent. But at the end of the day, if anyone goes to hell, it's because they will have rejected God and rejected and his patience has ended with them and they will suffer the consequences of their decision. And so God, God is just and anyone who's in hell will, ha will say, God's vengeance on me is vindicated. God is right to judge me. They will have to agree to that. Um, and so this shows an important side of God. We must understand two things about God. God is merciful and compassionate, but he's also um, just, and he will judge. And we need to, yes, have the love of God. We need to know the love of God, but we also need to have the fear of God. We need to know that God is not a soft touch, that God will judge. And when God's long-suffering runs out, he will judge. And when he judges, that's it, folks. So to know God, we have to understand the love of God and the fear of God. Well, God bless you. That finishes our study in Nahum. And uh, we, the next book we're going to get into is the wonderful book of Philippians.
Paul's letter to the Philippians in the New Testament, which will be quite a change from, from Nahum. Thank <music> you.